all God's people said, Amen. let us worship the triune God. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Who is strong? Who is a strong Lord like unto thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves arise, thou stillest them. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Our Father, you have triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider you have thrown into the sea. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And so we worship you now through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was crucified and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end, and amen. Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen indeed. Sin is dead. Death is dead. The devil, the accuser, is struck down, cast down, and his head has been struck with a mortal blow. Sorrow and suffering are swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, hell, where is your victory? And so the exhortation is to worship the Lord like this is all true. Beginning now, with confessing your sins. This Easter joy, this Easter triumph, is the death of our sins, all of them. And therefore, the only way to have this Easter joy is to agree with God that they are, in fact, dead. All your envy, all your bitterness, 
All your worry, all your ugly words, your petty idols, your bad attitudes, and appalling pride, all of it is dead. It died on the cross, so leave it there. Confess any of it that remains. Sin is death, and death is dead, because Christ is risen from the dead. And so as we prepare to confess our sins, turn to When I Survey the Wondrous Cross on page 267. So as you're able, please kneel as we confess our sins together. Out of the depths I have cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. Father, we confess that our nation draws near to you with their lips, but our hearts are far from you. We confess that our pastors and theologians teach lies, and we love to have it so. They say peace, peace, when there is no peace. They have called good evil and evil good, and we have suffered fools gladly. Father, forgive us and have mercy upon us for the sake of Jesus. Turn us to yourself and we shall be turned. Take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And we know that if we in the church attempt to hide any sin from you, this prayer will be ineffectual. And so we silently confess our individual sins to you now. Selah. Father, we ask all this in the good name of Jesus, and amen. amen. Please rise for the assurance of pardon. Isaiah 35 says, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, 
They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. You are the people of God. You have confessed your sins honestly. And God, your Father, is delighted to forgive. And so it's my privilege to declare to you that your sins are forgiven through Christ. Having been assured of our forgiveness, it's our privilege now to proclaim our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into Hades, on the third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to Psalm 119 in our abbreviated responsive reading. Blessed are the undefiled in the way. Who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. And who seek him with the whole heart. I have longed for your salvation, O Lord. And your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and I will praise you. And let your judgments help me. Amen. Amen. Testament reading this morning is Jonah 1, 17 through 2, 6. Then Jonah prayed, on, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth enclosed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. O Lord my God. 
Our New Testament reading is Matthew 28, 1 through 10. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like the lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We come now to our time of congregational prayer. I'll be lifting up both our petitions and our thanksgivings. Let us go to God together in prayer. Psalm 94, 17 through 19. Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Our Father, by your great power, you raised up our Lord Jesus from the grave. And so we know that regardless of the times in which we live, times full of uncertainty, confusion, fear, and turmoil, you shall be our help. You shall set our feet on solid ground. When you raised Christ from the grave, we rose up with him. So now we, as alive from the dead, can render true thanksgiving to you and bring heartfelt supplications with certainty that you hear us as beloved children. So we bring our sacrifice of thanksgiving with the psalmist who said in Psalm 95, 1 through 3, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Lord, we thank you for the gospel and that you have raised up ministers to proclaim it in the midst of darkness, plague, and cultural turmoil. We thank you especially for our fellow churches in Knox Presbytery and in particular for Pastor Burrow at the King's Congregation in Meridian. Bless this church with your joy and fill them with bold faith. We thank you that Rick Young's surgery went well and that he is now home for recovery. Give the Youngs the peace which you assure us of by the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Fountain family and their generosity to make their property available to us for the drive-in Easter service later today. Repay them richly for their kindness and generosity. And now, Father, we lift up our petitions to you using the words of Psalm 143, 5 through 8. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. Selah. Hear me speedily, O Lord. My spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Father, we continue to lift up those in our congregation who face ongoing health issues. Grant them patience and courage to face their trials. We ask that our church officers, both deacons and elders, would have manifold wisdom during this present moment and that they would serve and lead with humility, joy, and boldness. We also lift up our medical leaders, our fathers, and our civil magistrates and ask that in every sphere of governance, wisdom would prevail, justice would be established, righteousness would reign. God, you know the circumstances we face, and while we thank you for them, we also ask that you would deliver us from the pestilence of the coronavirus and also from the many instances of governmental and societal imprudence. We ask most poignantly that you would not merely change our circumstances and leave us just as we were. Rather, we pray that through all of this, you would conform us more fully into the likeness of our resurrected Lord, so that we might show forth the praises of him who hath brought us out of our darkness and into his marvelous light. In other words, through all this, grant a great revival, one that makes the Reformation and the Great Awakening look like indoor affairs by comparison. 
We thank you for all these blessings and look to you alone for the answers to our requests. And we do it all because Christ lives, and in his name we pray. Amen. text today is from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 and 17. These are the words of God. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the spirit who gave it. We thank you for the spirit who is present here with us today. And I pray that the word would be living and active and the spirit would be active in our midst and that we, as a result, would be living and active as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the Garden of Eden, when God shaped the first man from the dust of the ground, in Genesis 2-7, the Almighty was simply playing the part of a sculptor. He shaped Adam from the dust of the ground, but until the second half of the verse, this Adam was simply dust rearranged. After the semblance of a man had been fashioned out of the dust, God breathed into his nostrils, it says, the breath of life. And it was then that man became a living soul. The dust was still there, but something else was now present. The image of God was now present. But that image was soon to be marred, despite the warning of God that if he ate the forbidden fruit, he would, quote unquote, surely die, our first father disobeyed, and in the fulfillment of the curse, he was dragged back down to the dust of the ground. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. In Genesis 3.19. Notice it says, until thou return to the ground, until you return unto the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and unto dust you shall return return. So God brought Adam out of a state of death when he first created him. Uh, well, uh, non-existence is analogously a form of death. Adam wasn't there. So God brought Adam out of a state of quote-unquote death when he first created him. Adam was not, and then he was. He walked with God in the garden, and he was free to eat from all the trees but one. And so he had free access to the tree of life. The only tree that was prohibited was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden, and the tree of life was not prohibited 
to Adam and Eve until after they sinned, and that's when the cherubim were, uh, that's when the cherub was placed at the gate to keep them from coming back to the tree of life. But prior to that time, they had access to the tree of life. So Adam and his bride were at that time really and truly alive. When they sinned, they plunged themselves and all of their posterity down into the dust of death. In our text, this death is equated with being in our sins. This death is equated with being in a state or a condition of sin. That is what spiritual death is, separation from fellowship with the holy God. And that is what sin is, separation from fellowship with the holy God. Notice Paul's logic here. If the dead are not raised, then Christ was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, your faith is vain and you are still in your sins. Now, if you put all of this together, you should see that when Christ was raised from the dead and we were raised from the dead with and in him, we were also at that moment raised from our sins. Our sins are our death. Our death was our sinfulness. Sin is our death. Sin is our dust. So, let's consider the death that is sin. This is how Paul describes our previous condition, our condition prior to our conversion, our condition prior to the time when we came to Christ, as he talks about it in Ephesians chapter 2. This would be the first three verses of chapter 2. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Who were dead, notice, who were dead in sin. You were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Now notice here in this passage that death does not mean being stone cold out of it, because when we were, when we were in this condition of death, we were walking around in the course of this world. Notice, we who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked. What were you walking in? What were you living in? What were you breathing in? What were you conducting all your affairs in? You were conducting all of your affairs in the condition of death in your trespasses and sins. And then later, we conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires. We were doing things. We were, we were living, after, uh, living after a man of speaking. We were living in death. So death is clearly, in, according to the biblical uh, understanding, death is not simply cessation. If, I, if we were atheists, we would say when a creature dies, that's it. it he, he quits being animated. He quits moving around. It's simply cessation. But we are not atheists. We are not materialists. We are not naturalists. We are Christians, and we believe that death is not simply cessation. Death should be understood as separation. Death should be understood as separation. Physical death is the separation of soul and body. Physical death is a separation of soul and body. Physical death is not cessation. It is separation of soul and body. Spiritual death is the separation of man and God. Spiritual death is the separation of man and God. When we die to the ways of the world, we separate from her unholy ways. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So when you, uh, to separate from the world is to become holy, all right? And to be separate from the world, to become holy, is to die, right? You die to the world. Everyone who belongs to Christ is dead to the world. The world is crucified to them, and they are, and, and, and they are crucified to the world, as Paul says in Galatians. So that is what death is. Death is distance. Death is separation. Now, we used to live in a separated way from God. Aliens to him, enemies to him. Christ came down to us in that condition, and in his passion and death, he experienced that death. He came down to us in that place. He came down to us in the dust of death. He came down to us when we had been run to ground again, he came down to us there and he joined with us. 
My strength, it says in Psalm 22. My strength, in verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. That psalm is all about the Lord Jesus. That psalm is all, Jesus quotes it on the cross. He was experiencing that psalm when he was going to the, going to the dust of the ground. When he was going to earth, he was going to be buried in a tomb. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. So the Son of Man was going to spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus went to ground. He went to the dust. He went to the grave. So, you have brought me, he says, into the dust of death. So what does all this mean? What does all this entail? Look again to the words of our text, and let's work the logic in the other direction. The text says, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. If the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. But if the dead are raised, then it is not remarkable that Christ was the first to be raised. If we believe in the resurrection of the dead, if we believe in the resurrection of the dead at the end of history, then why should it be unusual for God to send his son into the middle of history and give us a harbinger of what was to come, to give us the first fruits of what was to come? Jesus um, brought the end of the world into the middle of history. That's what we basically are dealing with. Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, is the Lord Jesus taking the eschaton, the end of the world, and having that end of the world event, the resurrection of the dead, erupt like a volcano in the very middle of ordinary human history, which means that ordinary human history isn't ordinary human history anymore. That's all done. There's a new, this is a new creation. This is a new order. So Jesus basically uh, inhabits the last day. He comes down to earth, gra grabs a hold of the last day, and he comes and, and is born of a virgin, born of a woman, born under the law, lives a perfect sinless life, is crucified, dies, goes into the ground for three days, and then he comes up out of the grave, pulling the eschaton with him. All right? He comes up out of the grave, pulling the end of the world through with him. And then he, tell, he gives it to his disciples, and he tells them to start spreading this around. All right? Here, go sh share this. It's like the loaves and fishes. He's taking the eschaton. He's taking the last day. He's taking the resurrection day, and he's breaking it up into pieces. And the disciples are taking it off to every corner of the world, sharing the, sharing the last days, sharing the end of times, sharing uh, the ultimate culmination of all things. So if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. So... If the dead are raised, then it's not remarkable to have somebody be the first. If the dead are raised, then someone has to be the first one raised. And God saw to it that his son would be the first one raised. He'd be the elder brother. He'd be the pioneer. He'd be the forerunner. He'd be, he'd be the one who established this pattern. And then, if Christ was raised, then your faith in him is not in vain, and more than this, you are no longer in your sins. If, if Christ is raised, then your faith in a raised Christ is not in vain. And if your faith in a raised Christ, in a risen Christ, is not in vain, then that means you are no longer in the dust of death. You are no longer in your sins. You are no longer in that condition. There's therefore, Paul says in Romans 8, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no separation from God. That death is overcome. All right, so you're no longer in your sins. That means you're no longer separated from God. Um, you are going to live forever. Whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Present, there's a present possession. He has eternal life then, at that moment. So, apart from Christ... Apart from Christ, what is the condition of man? Apart from Christ, where are we? Apart from Christ, what is our situation? Separated from God, what good is anything? We are the ones who reached for the forbidden fruit in our vain quest to be as God. And what did we actually accomplish? Where did we actually arrive? Let's look back 
briefly at that uh, passage from Ephesians 2. We, we reached for the forbidden fruit under uh, the serpent lied, basically. The serpent said, you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Uh, but he radically miscast what that would entail. And we believed him, and we reached for the forbidden fruit. And what we got were trespasses and sins, a condition of death, as a way of life, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom are also we all conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Of the, out of that familiar tree, had the world, the flesh, and the devil, two of them are there, the devil and, uh, and the works of the flesh, and this condition of death. And the, so the tree of life, when they reach for the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life was somewhere in the area, the tree of life was somewhere around, and they were, they, their backs were, whether it was physically, whether they were physically turning their backs on it or not, they were metaphorically turning their backs on life and were reaching toward knowledge. They were reaching toward um, uh, rule. They were going to be like God. They were going to be able to discern good and evil the way a sharp-eyed ruler would. And what they got instead was awful. What they got instead was totally empty. So where did we reach for this vain promise? And what did we actually get? What did we actually achieve? Now we live in the dry and choking places. Dust over everything. Broken bottles. The air is sour. The smoke of selfishness has left an acrid taste on your tongue. The walls lean in. There's scarcely any light. Ghostly shadows flicker faintly on the curtains, but they don't mean anything. They don't mean anything. Nothing else moves. The only sound we can ever hear is our own muttering, the bootless sound of endless complaint. We would rather have a world, in this condition, we would rather have a world without God and without meaning than to have a world with God and with meaning. We would rather be meaningless than to be servants of God. We would rather be nothing than to be someone under his authority. The devil says in Milton's, uh, it's better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. And even that's a mistaken, blinded statement because the devil doesn't rule in hell. The lake of fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil's not the king of hell. Jesus is the king of hell. So it's a whole mis it, that, that's a mistaken setup to begin with. And then when, but, but it, it portrays the attitude, well, I would rather have no God and no point. I'd rather have no God and no point than to have a point determined for me from outside me by God. In the middle of all this dusty death, in the middle of all of it, Christ suddenly appears. He speaks to the wall opposite you, and it just vanishes. It had once seemed immo immovable and untouchable, and yet it just vanished. Christ turns to you and speaks one simple word, and that word is come. Come. That's all he says. That's all he needs to say. Come. So here we are, trapped in this terrible dungeon, trapped in this meaningless existence, trapped in a place of dust and the choking places, dry and choking places, and Christ annihilates the wall in front of us, and he says, come, follow me. But in order to get out, you have to surrender and follow someone else. In order to get out, you must have a Lord other than yourself. When you're sitting in that room all by yourself, you can pretend to yourself that you are your own Lord. You can pretend to yourself that you are autonomous. You can, you can pretend to yourself that you have control over your own destiny. You're the captain of your, your fate. No, you're not, but you can tell yourself that. And then Christ comes and says, as he said to the disciples, follow me, follow me, or come. This is the day of resurrection. This is the day of resurrection. So what is it that you will do? This is Easter Sunday. Will you follow him? This is, see, this, this world can never be the way 
it was before, because this world is the, the history of this world has right in the middle of it a man who came back from the dead. Because a man came back from the dead, it's not possible, it's not conceivable for everything else to remain around that to remain unchanged. Now, it looked unchanged, right? If you'd taken a photographer, if a photographer had walked the streets of Jerusalem five years before the resurrection of Christ and took pictures, he could walk around five years after the resurrection and take pictures of many of the same buildings, the same marketplaces, take a picture of the temple, and it would all look the same. And from our distance, we'd have trouble telling which one was five years before and which one was five years after. The world was much the same in that respect. But the world could never be the same. Because Jesus rose from the dead. That wall that vanished was death. That wall that vanished was condemnation. That wall that vanished was accusation. That wall that vanished was all the guilt that we have heaped up for ourselves. And when Jesus turns and says, come, he doesn't, say, he doesn't just say, come to you individually, although he does say it to you individually. He doesn't just say it to one, Smith or Jones or Murphy. He doesn't just say it to individuals, although he says it to every individual that we're told in the Gospel of Mark, preachers of the Gospel are authorized to go out into the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. And the gospel is Christ was crucified, was buried, rose again from the dead, and summons you to come. All right? That's the response to the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection is the objective gospel. Now, he doesn't just say that to Smith, Jones, and Murphy. He says it to Thailand. He says it to China. He says it to the United States. He says it to Kenya. He says it to the Congo. He says it to France. He says it to the UK. He says to every nation under men, come. Every nation under heaven, come. Come, follow me. And that's what the Great Commission is, is it not? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go disciple the nations. You tell them to come. I've told them to come. Now you go tell them to come. The Spirit and the bride say at the, at the end of the Bible, at the end of the book of Revelation, what does the Spirit say? The Spirit and the bride say, come. All right? Come. That's the, whole, that's the whole point. So this is the day of resurrection. What are you going to do? This is Easter Sunday. What are you going to do? Today is the day of all reckoning. Christ embraced death. Christ came into that room with you. Christ descended to the grave, and Christ has now risen triumphant. That is the good word. That is the gospel. What do you intend to do with it? There's only one word that you have to reckon with, and that word is come. Christians are those who do. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your kindness to us and the word you've given to us. We thank you for the gospel invitation. We thank you for your spirit. I pray that your spirit would be working in the hearts and lives of those who have been touched by this message. And I pray that they would be unable to resist your sovereign call. I pray that you and your effectual grace would reach down and touch many with that one word. I pray that they would come when you say, come. Our Father, we pray uh, to you, and as we do, we do so remembering the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our God and Father, we thank you that you have made us and you have remade us. And we thank you that part of the gift of that new creation is the ability to work and to provide 
for ourselves and for our families. And we thank you also that you have offered us the opportunity to give back to you in tithes and offerings and other gifts as a token of our gratitude to you and as a sign that it all belongs to you. And so we do so now. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Wilson, in the course of his message, said that when Christ came out of the grave, he came pulling the end of the world with him. That's what he brought into being. It reminded me of an image from C.S. Lewis's The Last Battle, where you have that scene where they've come through uh, the, uh, the, the barnyard, they've come uh, through the stable, and the dwarves are still sitting there in the stable, and it's just hay. But they've actually come out into a new world. The walls are down. The walls are gone. And everybody's around them saying, look, it's a new world. It's a new world. Here it is. And all they can see is hay and stubble and nothing else. And so the summons to come, the summons to come that only Jesus can give is the summons to see the new world as it actually is. The new world that Jesus brought into being at his resurrection. And this is the prayer that Paul had for the Ephesians and it's the charge for you. He prays that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That's the power that Paul prays that the Ephesians would see. And it's the charge that I, I charge you today, that you would ask God for that, that he would give you eyes to see that the walls have come down and the world is all new. As we close, let's sing the final verse of Ye Choirs of New Jerusalem for our doxology.
Now receive with believing hearts the blessing of your risen Lord and Savior. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. And amen.